Okay, well, thank you very much for that very nice introduction, Sophie. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be working closely with the museum over the next 18 months. I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, today's talk, well, in the title it says 19th century English meals, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the end of the 18th century too, just for a bit of historical context. It's also very important from the history of Worcester porcelain. And yes, I, I, I look at food history, food traditions, but anybody who looks at food history in, in any shape or form is really looking at social history. So the way people interacted with, with their food, how they obtained food and shared food as well. Um, today's talk is going to really look at the end product of the work when it comes to uh, eating food. So it's going to focus on dining in particular. Um, I'm going to look at all sorts of different groups so that might be in that dining room when food is being served up. I suppose the group that I'm focusing on more than any other are, I suppose, young women, sort of teenagers to their early 20s. And you'll you'll see why when I begin to talk about it. Um, but when you, uh, if you read Jane Austen novels or watch adaptations of them on TV, you often see young women making what seems to be superficially, you might say, rather theatrical and um, superficial um, worries, you know, about what they're wearing, uh, who's invited them to whatever gathering, um, what food they should choose, all these kind of things which seem unimportant perhaps to us today. But as you'll find that appearances can be deceptive. And actually these things that seem unimportant or superficial are in fact extremely important. Um, what I thought I'd quickly do is, Oh, there we go. Are we working? Oh, we had a, my laptop paused there. I thought I'd just have a little, maybe just two or three minutes, just talking about the historical context. Because although it's fun talking about what people were eating or not eating <laughs> in the 19th century, um, we need to look at the wider world rather more briefly, just to see what's going on, what what's informing them and maybe causing some of these differences and changes over that um, 19th century. Well, Worcester porcelain, its history really begins right in the center, slap bang in the 18th century. And it's a time of great industry. It's not quite an industrial revolution yet. There's not much steam power going around, but there's a lot of domestic production, especially from the point of view of textiles. Uh, so I like to call it an industrious revolution, even though it's not quite an industrial one yet. Um, it's a world with a burgeoning empire. So it's the first time we have, I think of what we think of today anyway, as, as globalization, I suppose, and the setting down of trade routes and uh, new interactions between other countries. There's a British empire, there's British colonies, of course, popping up everywhere, but other countries are doing that too. Sometimes it's not going well. Here's a great cartoon that I've got here of uh, William Pitt the Younger, the Prime Minister, and Napoleon carving up the earth, which has been shown as a great big plum pudding. Bits of the uh, planet there getting rights to, to trading in. So, you know, there was wars, there was friction, there was arguments about who could travel in what sea and use which ports. But there, there were some positive ones, positive relationships with, with the Dutch, for example. And there's also a big change going on with our infrastructure at this time within, within England. And the canal network is really quite important for us. Here's a bit of an anachronous image here because it's a photograph, sort of late Victorian by the looks of things. But, you know, this is the first time that uh, materials are able to travel in large amounts fairly swiftly without horses, really important. Of course, this would get replaced by, by the roads later on in the 19th century. And then there's another uh, revolution, and that's from the point of view of farming and horticulture. Uh, this is a time where there's a lot of selective breeding going on. Through the whole of the 18th century, the average weight of a sheep's carcass, for example, triples. You know, they're really getting this stuff down to a fine art. And the other thing is uh, the ability to grow a huge variety of fruit and vegetables um, out of season, which is something we always still uh, identify with now. We still want strawberries in February, 
well, they also did in the 18th century, <laughs> and they managed to do it. Um, so a lot of money, a lot of science, horticulture, um, and farming all really working together to increase production and, and variety. If you could afford to buy that variety, you know, there's a, <laughs> things are not being evenly distributed around everybody. But from the point of view of dinner times, there's two very important uh, price changes, price drops, and that's in fuel, in coal in particular. It replaces charcoal and wood as the main fuel in homes. So this means um, the price is four by more than half. So all of a sudden you can use um, more lengthy food preparation techniques, cooking things for longer. You can um, heat maybe the large dining rooms for longer. At times, maybe you couldn't do before, say in the depths of winter. And one thing that seems rather unimportant, wax really drops in prices. And this was a major cost because 18th century, the, most of the 19th century, people are lighting their homes with candles. And if you're wanting to have people round, well, it's quite an investment. And people tended to not invite people round when it was nighttime. You know, you, apart from Christmas, <laughs> where obviously there's a lot of expense, uh, any time around that, people tended to avoid it because it was just so expensive. But now things began to change and wax candles began to become rather cheap. So there's a response to this, dinner time moves. So it was at the beginning of the 18th century and had been for a long time at around maybe one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon, because otherwise it was going to start getting dark. And that was a bit of a pain because you had to, you were doing your work, whatever it was, quite important. And you suddenly had to stop, come to the uh, dining room and dine for two, two and a half hours or something. It really got in the way. It was a big old pain. So what people did was they moved dinner time to the evening around, well, I mean, there's always variation with these things. So somewhere between seven and nine o'clock in the evening. But there's a problem. You're having your breakfast at nine or 10 and then your next meal then now suddenly isn't going to be till eight o'clock in the evening. So you're going to get pretty hungry. So things crop up. So we get an established uh, dinner time, for example. So tea time appears at around three o'clock. Here's a, a, a very, it was a very popular 19th century tea time treat. These are called wigs. They're kind of a, a very enriched um, scone flavored with caraway seeds. Everyone used to eat them and we've all forgotten what they are now, but they are very delicious. But yes, tea time crops up later, um, lunch crops up and therefore an array of porcelain has to be provided for those times. Specialist ones, or maybe you, you just got to have a few more items than you used to do. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail in a moment. But um, Royal Worcester, or rather I should say Worcester porcelain in a, a, these uh, early decades, uh, you know, was, was very successful producing, well, I guess one group is items for the tea table. So we've got things like, uh, this teapot here, and it's very much, uh, very obviously, um, trying to replicate the artwork that would be found from the um, porcelain, the China coming from China, because that's the only place you could get it. It had to be imported from China, and the tea had to be imported from China too. So it's all very fashionable and all very expensive. So that's that's fine. The other thing that um, Worcester porcelain were doing. We're, we're producing items for the dinner, from the dinner table, which were very much um, replicating the styles that were already uh, found on the dinner table. Um, so they were very much copying the patterns and shapes to be found in silverware at the time. And these new porcelain items, they were expensive. I mean, it's cheaper. There's a pressure there for us to make them at home because then it's a bit more available uh, than getting expensive ones from from China, but they're still pretty expensive and they're still very much a status symbol. And you can see here, here's a, a sort of an, an older fashioned silver plate, which very much looks like a dying plate. And we're going to, I'm going to do some comparing of, of items in a moment. But what's important is really is the, the movement of dinner time to the end of the day gave more opportunities to be seen. So more people are going to be looking at status symbols because now that dinner wasn't 
in the middle of the day really awkward. It was at the end of the day, everyone had finished what they were doing. People could invite people around to each other's houses much more. So there's suddenly a pressure um, to buy more of these things. Now, not just these things, you know, buy better clothes, buy more expensive drapes, more furniture. And tea time, which started off as a fairly relaxed meal, suddenly also became an opportunity to be seen as people, mainly women, invited each other in the afternoon for tea. And this is all very much working into what an idea of building up, uh, an idea of civility and politeness and manners, which is extremely important. And there's two other things going on as well, which I, I think is important. There's, there's a new middle class, a, a whole cohort of people who previously weren't quite bumping up into that tier, people who had been making money from this new industry and the industrial, industrial revolution. So um, traders in textiles, for example, or even mechanics, shipwrights, stationers, <laughs> headmasters, people just suddenly popping up into this new middle class and therefore were expected to do all of the things, invite people for tea, have tea times, invite people around for dinner time. So suddenly, you know, you, there's, a, there's a pressure to keep up with the Joneses. And the other main difference is uh, the relationship between servants really changes. We kind of think of Downton Abbey or upstairs, downstairs, if you're a bit older, <laughs> about that kind of very separate worlds of servant and employer who only really interact, you know, in a very sort of brusque manner. Well, that wasn't really the case in the 18th century. It's uh, really a, one of the very few uh, remnants of the Middle, middle Ages where actually there was generations of relationships that had been built up and everyone trusted each other. Um, there was lots of things unsaid. However, because of this industrious and industrial revolution, people were being attracted to the big cities and the towns. So Manchester, London, York, Liverpool, Bristol, those sorts of places. So these landowners who'd had relationships with their uh, domestic staff for hundreds of years, in some cases, all of that just disappeared as people just moved to the exciting cities and big towns. And then in these towns, you had a lot of people who'd never been wealthy enough to have servants before and didn't really know what servants did, but they were expected to have them. There were no relationships at all. So you found that people were desperate, but for very different reasons. Some because there wasn't enough to go around in the countryside. And then in urban areas, there was so many and so many chances. You know, people often employed, uh, uh, servants on a whim and they were at best just inept but often you know they were uh there were there were thefts and, and all sorts of problems caused by them so what you actually got in the towns was the very first temping agencies this is an example this is elizabeth raffles um register office as they called them then this is an advert that she placed in a Manchester newspaper in 1763, but these were popping up in all the major towns and cities. It cost a shilling to be on her books and you had to provide a couple of uh, references. And if you wanted uh, to get hold of her books to have a look through who was on there, well, that cost you a, a shilling too. And of course, because people had no relationship anymore, it became very much more of a contractual thing. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a little bit but that's essentially the some background there for the major our major players and what's been happening from a historical point of view so let's have a look at tea time so there's disagreements as to when tea time as an institution began people in england have been taking tea since the 17th century the the old origin story goes that charles ii's wife catherine as part of a diary came with two barrels of tea. So the royals were seen taking tea very regularly. We're an aspirational country. Aspirational is gonna be a key word today. And straight away, the nobility wanted to eat it. The upper classes wanted to eat, uh, drink it even. And it began to filter down into the middle classes. But yes, people aren't quite sure where, where it happened. It's sometimes between the end of the 18th century and mid 19th century, which is quite a gap. I think that's because, you know, we're, we're a conservative country with a small C. We're sometimes uh, slow on the uptake and reticent to change our ways. I think in what well, it seems to me anyway, 
latter time of the 18th century is when your um, towns and cities started to take on tea time and it took a little bit later to get into the countryside. That's what I think is going on. It was informal, it was called low tea at around 3 p.m. Again, there's always variation, give or take an hour. And it was called low tea because you sat on low chairs, couches, and the tea was served on the little side tables beside you. So that's why it was called low tea. And as I said before, there's a big pressure to buy sets. Um, some people just pipping into the sort of middle class category, such as Robert, Robert Sharp here on my example. He's from a headmaster from Yorkshire. So suddenly his, his wife is expected now to have people around for tea. Now he's become headmaster. And it's not just a case of buying a teapot and a couple of cups, of course, because to go with that, you've got the cups and the saucers, the milk and the cream jugs, the sugar bowl, the side plates, the serving plates. And in his diary, he wrote, if this be not encouraging manufacturers, I don't know what is. He, poor thing was destroyed. He was having to keep it all wrapped up in newspaper under his bed because they couldn't afford to buy a dresser to display it on. And they barely could afford to actually hold the tea times because the tea and the treats that went along with it was so expensive. So, you know, people who, if some people, it was, you know, a, a huge chunk out of their salaries and earnings, you know, tr trying to keep up with the Joneses, which shows the pressure that people were really under. What made up a spread might actually seem rather um, plain and boring now. Um, you know, all these posh tea times you get at Claridge's or whatever, they didn't really occur in the 18th and 19th centuries. It was things like bread, butter and jam. Uh, plain biscuits, of course. You got to have tea and biscuits. Here's a an old recipe for some biscuits. One of my favourite things. They're now much maligned, but I think is very nice. Seed cake, <laughs> flavoured with caraway seeds. And I've put these recipes on just to show you. You know the, the the people in the kitchens downstairs or at the other side of the building. This is just to make some regular biscuits. We, we don't even think about this now buying biscuits, but. Look at this. You've got to beat your eggs for half an hour. That's your first stage. You've put a few more ingredients and you've got to whisk it an hour all by hand. There's no uh, metal balloon whisks at this point. It's um, birch twigs tied together that you're whisking things. You know, real, really hard work. And the same goes for the for the seed cakes as well, beating whites of eggs for half an hour. Imagine trying to get um, egg whites to a stiff peak with a bunch of twigs. <laughs> Absolute nightmare. <laughs> And the people to make these things, confectioners, we probably call them patissiers now because confectioners suggest sweets. And although that was part of the job, it was making cakes and making desserts. And it was the desserts really that they were sought after. So big pressure, especially if you lived in the countryside and you didn't have access to shops, big pressure to employ a confectioner. All right, well, let's have, let's have a look at it from the point of view of sort of social history now. That's how it worked. Tea time was designed to test, designed to test everyone there, mainly women, although some of the younger uh, men of the hosting family might be there to, you know, uh, pour out tea and things, help out. And it's an opportunity to really show off. So that's why I've put a peacock up here. Here's a bit of peacock biology. It's going to be important, I promise. <laughs> um, here's our lovely peacock here looking resplendent full of bright colours, showing off to the females. This is a male peacock. Hopefully he'll be successful and get a chance to mate with them. He's got all these bright colours because he's eating a varied diet. These, all these colours come from the food that he eats. He doesn't produce them himself. He also has a bright uh, plumage, which attracts uh, predators. He's managed to fend those off or run away from them. And he's managed to carry around a stupid great big tail the whole time and managed to get all of this food too so it's really showing off what a uh, high quality male he is well the same is going on with tea time everyone's there showing off now there's a difference here of course because i've just said it's mainly women and yes it is mainly women but this is um showing off for the man of the house the lord or whoever who's showing off even though he's not there because he's do off doing something else he's showing off all the food, all the porcelain, all the drapery, all the servants, because he's paid for all of that. So he's showing, but it's, it's having the ladies of the house, the women of the house doing the work for him, but it's all to show how successful he is 
not how successful they are. So there's the there's the pressure to do everything correctly and appropriately, and you know, and sort of pass these social tests, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. So it's a lot of peacockery, uh, and it's all at the end funnels down to the, the Lord. It's very much a patriarchal thing, even though for many of these environment environments, it's uh, women who are there. Let's have a little look about uh, teacup design now. Our peacock has a huge handicap with this great big stupid tail. And the same <laughs> actually goes on with the items that they are using uh, for tea time. They're designed not to be easy to use. These tiny little handles, which you've essentially just got to pinch with your uh, forefinger and thumb, uh, it makes it uh, difficult. You've got a saucer which clanks, you've got a teaspoon which clanks. Are you able to drink your tea without spilling anything on yourself? You're not sat at a table, like a dining table, you're sat on a couch. So, you know, there's not necessary places to put things down. Are you eating your biscuits without getting crumbs? Are you doing this with all perfect poise and posture? And are you making the appropriate small talk? Not talking too much because no one likes anyone pushy, but no one wants a shrinking violet either, so you better get it just right. <laughs> so it's really, really quite difficult. But, you know, it's, it's really showing off that, that what the, the Lord is saying of that household. He's saying, I can afford to have all my women not work and spend a huge amount of time working on their posture, working on their diction, um, going out and selecting this porcelain and, and the drapes for the house. So yes, can your behavior be faux pas free? I mean, just talking about it makes me nervous. One thing that I briefly mentioned, just because uh, maybe as a point of interest is, yes, more servants occur in towards the sort of um, middle of the 19th century and onwards. Because of this contractual thing, they just become another thing to have, like porcelain, like furniture. So people start collecting servants and servants know that they're um, really in the driving seat because there's a lot of um, employees who are very uh, desperate. And here's a, here's a little entry from Parson Woodfold. He was a diarist uh, around 1800. And he was a, well, I mean, we would say he's a geek now. He was writing everything down, what he was eating, what he was doing. And it's great because um, not very many people did that kind of thing because it's fairly uninteresting, but it's great for us food historians. And look, this is what he said. Two servant maids came to me this morning and offered their services to me. I agreed with them both and they had to come to me here midsummer day next. One of them is to be an upper servant and I am to give her tea twice a day. That was one of her perks. Servants might have been given the second or third brewings of tea, but by the time you tick into the 19th century, you know, servants are demanding as part of their contracts, you know, virgin tea leaves. And when people, when, when um, domestic servants left service, they would go off and get maybe start up a business in town and introduce working class people to the idea of tea time and uh, drinking tea with milk and having tea sets. So what you see is that the uh, domestic servants are actually a bit of a co conduit to kind of making the idea of tea and tea time something that everybody could, you know, a much more democratic thing for everyone to do. That was called high tea. It still is called high, high tea in some places in the north of England. Here's a depressing picture. <laughs> this is from Bleak House by Charles Dickens. These two guys are having a very sad tea time here. But this is to illustrate that it's high tea because it's on a high table. Working class people tended to not have couches and side tables. They had a kitchen table to eat from. These chaps managed to find a, a tablecloth too, but it's fairly depressing. But that's why it was called high tea and it became the main meal of the day at, well, five, four, five to five thirty a day. My mum and dad still have high tea at five o'clock every day, for example. So people do it. And there's this, always this big argument, isn't there, about what you should call the main meal of the day. Some people think it should be tea. Some people think it should be called dinner. It's one of the great food debates. <laughs> and it turns out that actually it's one of the few occasions that everyone's right, because what you're doing is you're arguing about two different meals. Tea and dinner are two different meals. It's just different people are using those times to have their meals. So yes, one of the few uh, 
times where everyone's right. That's nice in a, in a world where everybody's wrong at the moment, isn't it? Okay, well, let's talk about dinner time. This is the, this is the meat and bones of the, of the talk. For the first hundred years of, of uh, Worcester porcelain, people were having their dinner served in the style, in a French style, service à la Française. And there's an example here this is a, again a, from Elizabeth Raffold's book, which she wrote in uh, the sort of latter half of the 18th century, but this was the key text for the next hundred years, essentially. People were very much using this as a, as a blueprint of uh, how to dine. And this is how a course was laid out on a dining table. So you, you would walk in and you would find the food already there waiting for you and you'd sit around it and it's a nice buffet, but you don't have to stand up, which sounds actually pretty good to me. It was typically three courses. And at least at the beginning, uh, the, there was minimal servant involvement required. Once everyone settled, they would sometimes even be dismissed altogether and the diners would just get on being social and eating their dishes, passing them around to each other, you know, really, really social. And this example, yeah, this is the directions for a grand table. So this is you know, as opulent as it gets for a really big celebration. But typically the first course is made up of soup and then fish, as it often is now, and roast meats and sort of savory and substantial things. The second course, well, there's still some meat there. There's some small game. This is the second course. And you can see down here, there's roasted hare. Up here, there's pheasant. There's macaroni cheese. That's an English invention, it's not American. And there it is, macaroni, I'm not sure if you can see that. And there are puddings. This is uh, a traditional pudding that I made called a hunting pudding, eaten not as dessert, but uh, with meat. This one specifically for eating with game. So maybe it was eaten with that roasted hare. And edible table decorations, which were sweet. So again, before we've got to dessert, and this is one of my favorite things. So any excuse to talk about these. Here's a couple of examples that I uh, came up with. This one is bacon and eggs in flummery. Flummery is essentially a jelly, but it's made with milk and with almonds. Uh, yes, yeah, a nice streaky bacon there, poached egg. And there's a little bit of apricot there that's meant to be the yolk. This is a Taj Mahal made out of flummery that I made with a Victorian Taj Mahal mold. These are all different colors and flavors. And the one on the bottom is chocolate and coffee flavor which is, was very delicious actually, but unbelievably expensive. Chocolate and coffee, you know, really expensive. Sugar being very expensive. And you got to extract this gel gelatin over a couple of days from some calves feet. You're not going to the shop and buying some Dr. Oetker <laughs> um, sheets of gelatin to make those. Although that's what I did. The third course is the really sweet stuff. So, and that's the dessert. So there is a bit of maybe cheese and biscuits, but it's glacé fruit and exotic fruits and, and things like that. I'm going to go back and talk about the dessert in a bit more detail. What's crazy is no two dishes were the same. Those tables look nice and symmetrical, but no two dishes were the same. On the um, directions for a grand table, there's 25 dishes for each course, and there's three courses. So there's 75 unique dishes just for one meal there. Absolutely crazy. It's such a huge amount of work for people in the kitchen. Now, this is something I spoke about at the beginning. Um, porcelain is very much sort of coming in from the fashionable point of view, you know, with the Chinese uh, inspired artwork, but it's also trying to replace silverware. You know, if anything new is coming in, the best way is to have a, a, an element of familiarity about it. Mm -hmm. So here's an example, that's that silver plate that I showed you here, but here's an early piece of uh, Worcester porcelain with the beautiful uh, cobalt blue here. And of course, there's a lot of work going into the artwork, but it's essentially the same. You've got the petals of a flower here and you do on the silverware too. When you walk into the room, especially if it's in the winter time, it's gonna be quite dark. The room, the, the, the table will have lots of candles on there. And the only other light coming from the room probably is coming from the fire. It's just from the, the flames in the fire. So it's fairly dark and the table itself is the focal point. 
So already it's quite a stressful sort of a arena, social arena to be in. But you're shown to your seat by a servant. And when you sit down, what's in front of you? Well, there's probably a, a plate like this. There's a knife and a fork. Forks are quite new uh, at the, in those few opening decades of, of uh, Worcester porcelain. You have a knife and a fork, a spoon, a glass or two for wine and water. You'll have a tankard. Oh, I, I absolutely love the tankards in the collection. It was very difficult which one to choose here. I've gone for this one. I'm a sucker for anything with anything sort of botanical. You see, I keep going for anything with uh, with flowers in it. And, and I love this sort of hand-painted um, gilt work around the edges. I just think it's fantastic. Um, so you might have a tankard. The, the men would typically have a tankard with ale or um, cider in there, depending whereabouts in the country you were. And there'd be an elaborately folded napkin, usually folded around a bread roll. And that's it. Very, very basic. Now, I said there's uh, the food's already laid out when you walk in there, but a lot of this food is hot. And you've got to really fight against time because everything's getting really cold. Um, and there's a, a battle to keep things warm. So there might be cloches for example, covering it. But porcelain steps in there too to try and give a hand. This is another two of my favorite, my favorite things. Surprise, surprise, there's some, uh, <laughs> some botanical element. This is a hot water plate. So it looks like a regular plate, but actually inside there's a cavity and you pour hot water in there and it keeps the plate nice and warm. So you can put things like maybe there's fish in a butter sauce, which if it got cold, you know, fish goes cold very, very quickly. Butter sauce congeals very quickly. But if you put it in a nice warm, nice warm plate, it's going to be very happy there for, you know, maybe uh, 30, 40 minutes, you know, when people actually start digging into it. Uh, below here, this is very important, especially if you're holding a celebration in um, January or February, this is a gravy spoon warmer <laughs> so you feel again fill this with hot water you put your your gravy spoon your little ladle in there and that and this, this goes to show how cold things were you know you, if you were just using a regular spoon that wasn't warmed up and you dipped that into your gravy you'd solidify any fat <laughs> straight onto the spoon um, so a nice warm ladle means you can deftly and swiftly and, and neatly take a nice big ladle of, of warm gravy and it'll still be warm when you've poured it on your plate hopefully um, the soup is ladled out by the hostess sat at one end of the room helped by some servants to pass them round the fish sat at the opposite end at the fish the host at the other side the other side of the room carves the fish and then meats are carved by both if there's one meat, but it's rarely, there's usually more than one meat. We're quite a meaty country. So, so both uh, host and hostess are expected to carve the meats. And here's a bit of a, a, a strange thing. It's a strange thing, the English language. So if you imagine what happens is that uh, soup is dished out. Everyone has some soup. It all gets taken away. The fish is carved. That gets carved, handed around, that's taken away, and then replacing them, because you've always got to have a symmetrical design, are removes, they're called special dishes called removes, which doesn't make quite sense because you're introducing it to the table, you're not removing it from the table. But anyway, it's a bit confusing, but usually those removes are the uh, roasts. So then they can be placed in front of the host and hostess where their soup tureen was. All right, let's have a look at the, the, social, the social history again. So that's the setup, that's how it works. Power play is a big power play, power play at work between the, the hosts and the invited people going both ways. It's hard to know who's in the control seat. <laughs> the first problem, especially from the point of view of hosts, you've got to get your seating arrangements right. A new thing had come in, a new way of seating people around the table called promiscuous seating which sounds much more exciting than it really is. <laughs> All it means is uh, people were seated uh, male, female, alternately around the table. It used to be that all the men were down one end, all the women were down the other end, and all the men would get terribly drunk and boisterous and just ruin the whole thing for everybody. 
Now we're in the 18th, 19th century, we're much more civil and much more polite, so we're mixing things together. Hopefully that the, the, the men will be at least less raw, raucous and annoying, but you know, you can never count on it, can you? Now, here's the social things. If you're serving your soup from a soup tureen, here's a lovely um, get an early example of a Worcester porcelain um, soup tureen. I am managing to get things out fairly swiftly so people aren't waiting around for their soup. You know, you might have 18 people around a table, for example. Are the portions the same? Are you getting drips on the rims of the bowls? Are you getting drips on the tablecloth? You know, how much, how much in control are you? Everybody is watching. <laughs> they remember that. When it comes to the carving, I mean, it's something that still happens now. At least once a year at Christmas, someone's expected to stand at the table and carve the turkey. And I've done many a botched carving. I don't know about I don't know about you. <laughs> Here's a, a clipping from Mrs. Beaton's book of household management here with some helpful. Actually, I don't really think they're that helpful, but it, this is a, a shoulder of mutton here. And these little diagrams, the one to two, um, two to three, three to four, it tell, tells you where to make your incisions and what direction and what order. And here a full quarter of lamb. That's for advanced carvers only, I'm assuming. <laughs> but this has been going on since the Middle Ages, right from where um, Knights of the Realm, who were in attendance to you know big important meals, were expected to carve for the Lord, maybe the King, who was there at the top table. And it's a way to show your deafness with a sword that wasn't military. So to be much more delicate. So are you getting your... Um, Slices even, is everyone getting a fair portion? Is everyone getting a bit of fat meat and a bit of lean meat? People expected a mixture on their plate and you got to all, do all this pretty quickly. You know, it's an absolute nightmare. This isn't to do with porcelain, but I just think it's interesting. I'm gonna throw it in, in here. Wine glasses begin to shrink. When you get into the 19th century, they become not much bigger than a shot glass, like a little sherry glass, I suppose. And that's because tablecloths have become so expensive. People were worried about people knocking over claret and port and things like that and staining it. So what you had was no one had a glass and you'd have the butler going around, prowling around. <laughs> this is when there was more servants involved. Um, you would ask for some wine and he'd give you essentially a shot of wine. You'd knock it back, you'd give him it back. He'd maybe give it a wash or a rinse so you can give it to somebody else. And that's how people were were um, consuming their wine, sort of shot by shot. Very bizarre. It didn't last for very long, as we'll find out. One of the big places you can fall over, folks, is your bread roll etiquette. So I'm going to talk about that very briefly. On no account should you cut your bread roll open. Heaven forbid, you got to break it up with your fingers. It goes back maybe to more pious times where a meal, part of the meal is, of course, the breaking of bread. So that's what people are still, that's sort of big symbolic meaning, you know, going back to a time where people were much more sort of, a, uh, life was focused much more on faith than perhaps it is today. Um, don't be buttering your bread. That's a no-no, even though butter is provided. So things like that are set up to see if people <laughs> are following the rules. And in fact, you might want to not even use your bread roll whilst it's the soup course, because when it came to the fish, people, I mean, there's the infamous um, fish knives and fish forks, of course, that uh, appear at the end of the Victorian era. But a lot of people thought that was an affectation and people didn't really like that. The traditional way to eat your fish was to take bits of bread and use the bread to push the fish and maybe a bit of sauce onto your fork. Then you could eat your fish. And then, of course, your bread soaked up a bit of sauce so you can eat, eat the bread. And that stayed on in some places right up into the 20th century those sort of um, ways of, e of eating fish. But from the point of view of women, especially, who were not really expected to eat things like pies and roast mutton and ox, they were more expected to eat the more delicate foods, of course, it's very gendered. So vegetables, uh, eat uh, more fish. If they're gonna eat meat, you know, to stick to poultry. And this was the opportunity really to test any of the younger women for their their strategy and their etiquette stripes or not, you know, oh, you know th there might be marriages on on the cards, you know, um, relation um, uh, unions between families, people checking each other out. So big pressure to get this kind of stuff right. 
And well, this piece here, this little tureen is fast becoming maybe my favorite piece in the collection. Interestingly, actually, it's, it's still following the, the silverware um, style, there's sort of scallop shells and the, and the scallop edges. But notice, this is a little bit, little bit later now, there's no Chinese artwork, artwork because at this point now, well, I guess people have sort of ditched ditched the China um, fashions and it's all gone towards the amazing variety of food and fr fruit and vegetables they can grow now in England. So there's all these nice fruits that have probably been produced in hot houses and against hot walls. And here is a very fashionable globe artichoke. Um, and there's no another reason why there's no um, Chinese artwork there too is because you're making your own um, porcelain. And at this time, ticking into the 19th century, we're getting our tea from India. So we're not dependent on China. So now everything's suddenly British. And there's a more sense of bigger sense, sort of sense of ownership. So there's there's very much more British. Um, style coming back to the to the designs, what people think are important. Um, here's a lovely set of uh, here's a lovely cutlery set with a, some puce decoration there and the sort of pistol grip handles. This is the kind of cutlery you would be using. So imagine in here you've got a nice tureen of peas. Um, whoops. And there's a, there'd be a serving spoon to help you. They're, they're probably covered in melted butter or something, so they're all nice and glistening. Um, you've got to ladle some of those out to yourself. Because if you're a young woman, that will be put in front of you. You'd be expected, even if you're not eating it yourself, because it's in front of you, you'd be handing it out to other people as part of the food sharing. So you, anyway, you put this onto your plate. You've got to deal with this fork, which you maybe you can't see there. The, the prongs are completely flat. And this is actually quite kind because most of the forks were two pronged. Now, how are you eating those peas without them, without them boiling off everywhere? <laughs> covered, you know, covered in melted butter, landing on you. It requires a huge amount of practice to carry these things off. These things aren't meant to be easy to use. I mean, the idea of cutlery, if you think about it, is completely ridiculous. It's really hard to use. We don't think about it now because we all use it, but I think it's ridiculous anyway. Here we go. Drum roll. We've got a asparagus server. <laughs> here it is. A little bunch of asparagus spears would be here, tied up with a bit of ribbon on a plate as well. Plonk that in front of some young lady you would like to test. Next to it is some nice melted butter, probably flavoured with black pepper and lemon. And this is another big test. So you, everything's eaten by knives and forks, no fingers. Apart from the bread roll, that is, that's the exception. <laughs> you've got to get some asparagus spears to you. You've got to dip it into the sauce, no fingers. And you've also got to eat it without looking too lascivious, because, you know, Asparagus is one of the sexy vegetables, so you're going to be eating this spear. Don't be licking your lips in a coquettish fashion, you know, because it's got covered in the butter sauce. Can you remain uh, civil, poised and looking, you know, virginal and all that kind of stuff? You know, it just sounds like a complete nightmare to me. <laughs> um, but things begin to change in the middle of the 19th century big difference and it's a different service that gets called service a la Rus, russian service it's a new kind of opulence really to do with dining that comes over to our end of europe uh, it begins to get accepted it takes a long time for it to be accepted because it's it's such a big change and people don't like change but it was such an investment too and the reason it was an investment was Instead of all the food being out there at, at the beginning of the meal, everything came out in separate courses. I mean, it's how we eat now. So you might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound very opulent to me. But all of a sudden now, you've got to have more servants because they've got to carry in all these plates <laughs> that have been dished out to people, served to people. You've got to have even more porcelain because you don't want to be using the same plate twice for two different courses. That would never do. So there's a pressure to have more porcelain, more plates, different size plates for different types of um, food. More cutlery. This is, of course, the, the crazy cutlery setups where you got to work from the outs outside in. And of course, we've got our fish knife here, <laughs> the famous fish, fish knife. Huge, and the glassware, yeah. So gone are the little shot glasses of wine. You've got 
every glass for every eventuality for your paired wine to go with the different food. A huge investment. And one of the things that I think is quite sad, really, is that the food is no longer the theatre in the room. It's the servants marching in and it's the dinnerware. And of course, that includes the porcelain that's on show, which is great. And it's a, it's a fantastic spectacle. But it's a shame that some of those wobbly desserts have to go, I reckon. So on the table instead are I mean, things that have been made by Worcester uh, right from the beginning. But it was beginning to appear on dining tables now. So lovely urns and vases. And well, here's an example from a from a, a book here, a plate from a book, which but it's not necessary to my taste. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, there's no food on this um, table that's decked out. Look for service a la Russe. It's all fresh flowers, which is nice. You know, all on a trellis. I would say rather over the top candles from a personal point of view. But you know, there's no accounting for taste, is there? But yeah, the food element, the food theatre has gone and the theatre now is purely um, thrown out expense. You know, no expenses have been spared. So we've got to have all these servants, expensive livery. You've got to have more people downstairs. There's so much more washing up to do. <laughs> so yeah, you have to hire in more staff for, for these big meals. And people didn't know what to do. They were so used to having all these different foods on the table. They didn't know how many courses to have. And you'd have these crazy 15, 16, 20 course meals that went on for six hours and things like that. Nobody knew what knew what they were doing. <laughs> Eventually it calmed down. We've got here, uh, well, actually we're ticking into the 20th century here. This is 1904. And this is a menu from Windsor Castle during the reign of Edward VIII. And you can see things have calmed down at this point. We've got an eight course meal, but there's still a choice of things sometimes. People still thought they still had to provide a choice like, like we used to have. But we've got a menu. Changing to service uh, to Russian service meant we invented the menu. You didn't have to have a menu before because all the food was on the table when you walked in. You knew what you were having. Whereas now, with things being brought out in separate courses, well, people had no idea what was around the corner. So we had to invent the menu. <laughs> Again, something we don't think about, but you know, there had to be a reason for it to be invented, and that's that's one of those things that we take for granted. Uh, very quickly, I've gone down a couple of rabbit holes when I was talking, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, dessert time is a, oh, I've written another opportunity, but I mean, this is, this is the crew. The second course was a crescendo and then we're in dessert and it's pow, foul, fireworks time. You're probably going to have some exotic fruits that has been grown at great expense. Things weren't being imported from the tropics. They had to be grown in England dreary old England. And here's an example here from the back of uh, a book uh, showing sort of seasonality throughout the year. And this is the stuff that people to get hold of. This was, this is the north of England as well, by the way. So in March, they're able to grow forced strawberries for the dinner table. That's pretty good. You know, when, when a strawberry is really good in England normally, July, maybe? Uh, we've got down here apricots for tarts. The north of England in April, they're able to grow apricots for tarts. It's absolutely crazy. And then ticking over here, this is we're in sort of autumn territory here, but there they are, the famous melons and pineapples that people were growing. So expensive that, um, you know, you, you had to have a head gardener with hot houses, hot walls. And it was just phenomenally expensive. It was so expensive that people would actually rent melons and pineapples for the evening and then give them back at the end <laughs> just for people to look at during the dessert course but much of this produce you can see everything else there it was a great variety of food available to people these foods were used to make the desserts glacé fruits uh, things called suckets which um the closest thing to a sucket now is something like um the stem ginger and syrup that sort of yeah really sweet stuff but from my point of view the absolute Cream of the crop are ices, and this is my current favourite piece at uh, the Royal Worcester uh, Museum of Royal Worcester at the moment. And this is an ice pail. It comes in three bits. You can see there probably that this is actually a lid. If you take off that lid, there's a little bowl inside. If you take that bowl out, you fill sort of the main body of the pail with ice and salt, which drops the temperature. You can pop the bowl in, pop your ice cream or sorbet. Put the lid on. You can see the lid there is concave to add more ice and salt. 
And that keeps things absolutely perfectly chilled, but not too cold for a good couple of hours. And I was very lucky to actually use one of these a, a few weeks ago with the food historian Ivan Day, who, I mean, I'm not sure whether it, it's amazing or whether it's very foolish letting people use all this equipment that's very expensive and old. But yes, we managed to use it and it did keep the uh, ice cream that we kept absolutely perfect. It didn't melt, but it didn't freeze into a solid lump either. Absolutely remarkable bit of engineering, really. And if you lived in the in the uh, countryside, you had to have an ice house, which is basically an underground bunker. <laughs> Again, at great expense, you'd be uh, importing ice from the Arctic Circle because Britain's never been that dependent for um, ice, proper compact ice. So you, yeah, you've got to bring that in from, from abroad. And there's other bits and bobs that are expensive. So these, these ice pails are very expensive items. You've got these lovely little um, sorbet ice cups here, which are like little teacups with saucers, with lovely little uh, bits of artwork uh, hand-painted on there. What you can't see on that picture at the back is the handle. It's the tiniest, most awkward handle you've ever seen in your entire life. You basically just about pinch it between your finger and fourth thumb. Can you use that without clattering? I mean, I could just imagine dropping on the floor or something. Oh my goodness. And then downstairs in the kitchen, there's the churns. These things have got to be churned by, by hand. There's no refrigerators, there's no freezers, huge amount of work. And again, going back to talking about um, working with Ivan, Ivan Day a few weeks ago, we got an opportunity to make some of these ices. Uh, these at the top here are um, frozen cabinet puddings invented by the chef um, Antoine Karen. This one was my favorite. This was a um, rose and quince flavored ice cream. That was absolutely delicious. And these are some little water ices, sorbets in different molds. And I absolutely love these. This is a, these are quite easy to get online for, for not that much money. The swap, very fashionable things at the time. The swans here, that's a mussel. <laughs> Here's a, a, a bowl of fruit. This is my favorite one, a little raspberry tart. That's my, that's my favorite one. I saw one online recently, which was a slice of cheese, <laughs> which made me giggle. But a huge amount, a huge amount of work, a huge amount of in, infrastructure and, and cost for what amounts essentially to, I guess, having a couple of mouthfuls of frozen dessert, huge amount of expense. Right. I've chunted on. Very quick summary for you. Uh, I hope in what I've told you today that, uh, you know, so the social changes and the economic changes of the country is very much reflected in, well, the creation of uh, Worcester Porcelain in the first place, but how it changes over that sort of the first 150 years of it um, being in existence. Uh, and there's a great amount of pressure put on young women in particular. So next time you are tuning into um a Jane Austen adaptation. I hopefully uh, have a bit more sympathy for <laughs> these young women who are really, you know, gnashing their teeth and rubbing, you know, <laughs> rinsing their hands, being very stressed about social situations, very stressful. In the 20th century, this life ebbs away, at least for the middle classes, of course, you know, no longer have uh, domestic servants to, to help out. And Royal Worcester has to adapt to this too with the oven to table where here this one's even got a handy handy recipe in it because housewives are now having to cook clean and entertain people because that was still expected of course the uh amounts that maybe people were expected to have and use especially for the middle classes were rather reduced and things were much more streamlined it Royal Worcester did such a good job of, of changing and adapting to other things. And really a final thought, I suppose, is we've, we're only a quarter of the way through the 21st century. <laughs> so I wonder what different challenges are going to be thrown at Royal Worcester on our journey to the year 2100 and how it's going to respond. But I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to do some very quick thank yous. Thank you very much to, to Sophie and Fiona for making me feel so welcome at the museum and um, having some very exciting conversations about the really exciting stuff that we got planned for the next sort of 12 months or so. Thanks to Louise Price in, um, in the archives for showing me the ropes and being very patient with me and for finding some obscure items for me. <laughs> Thanks to Ivan Day, because of course, let, letting me use all that historical um, equipment recently was great. Yeah, if you're interested in this period of history and social history, uh, yes, my, my book, Before Mrs. Beaton, which was published earlier this year, you can find out a lot more. 
However, if you enjoy podcasts, I do have a podcast. This title took me ages to think of, the British Food History Podcast. And Ivan Day actually helped me produce uh, an episode of that. So you can go back and listen there. Loads of episodes about 18th and 19th century food. So check that out if you're interested. And there's my blog, British Food of History. Um, easy to remember um, website, BritishFoodHistory.com, where there's short essays and various recipes and reenactments of foods if you're interested in that sort of stuff. There's somebody else who I've forgotten to say thank you to. I've just realized, of course, that's thank, thank you for, for listening. Thank you very much.